Hi guys, welcome to Miss Carly's Scenic Design Masterclass! Yay! Um, this will be Oklahoma Children's Theater first ever exclusive class on scenic design, which is very exciting. I personally um, found my love for scenic design at Oklahoma Children's Theater and have been expressing it there and at other companies ever since. So if you're interested and ready to get crafty, um, I will start teaching you guys about scenic design. Um, let's start from the beginning. Some of you guys might know me from painting summer floors. Some of you guys might know me from um, helping on last summer's cool pig mural. Some of you guys might know me from teaching classes back in the day, probably like four or five years ago, at Oklahoma Children's Theater's main campus. Very exciting. Some of you guys might know me all the way far back to when I was a camper at Oklahoma Children's Theater. So, that's me. I cannot wait to get to know you guys through your designs and see what you've made, um, but let's start. So. First things first, what is a scenic designer? So you kind of got to think about it. Scenic design is design for the stage. So designing for a stage could mean a lot of things. It could mean the costumes. It could mean the music. It could mean the blocking, like where the actors move when. It could mean the lights. It could mean the sound. It could mean so many different things, but a scenic designer, a scenic designer, we are the people that create the environment. So the environment could mean sand if it's a beach. It could mean rocks if we're in the wild, in the wilderness, like um, OCT's Lord of the Flies a couple years ago. It could mean that we're inside a house or a palace or a castle or a dungeon and what the scenic designer's job is it is to tell the audience which are the people watching the plays or movies or um, music videos where we are so let's get started I hope you don't mind I wrote down some questions that I just assume you guys would have I wish I could be there in person. I know we all do, but it is so cool that I get to teach at Oklahoma Children's Theater from all the way up north in Vermont, which is one of the most northern states in the United States of America. And let me tell you, it is cold and snowy all the time, and it's only November. Anyways, so here's a very northern, very snowy um, masterclass from Miss Carly. So. What is a scenic designer? We just talked about that. That is the designer for stage that tells us where we are. And their job is to design the environment. So designing the environment, we said, tells the audience where they are and it puts you in control of the audience's mood, kind of the actor's mood, definitely the actor's safety. So there's very, very important things to think about when you're designing an environment for people to play in. Um, okay, so what do scenic designers do? Who do they work with? And why does scenic design matter? So those are three very important questions. A scenic designer not only designs the environment for plays on stage, but they could design the environment for a movie. They could design the animated environment for a cartoon. They could design um, anything. So that's the magic of it. So do we want to talk about what is a designer? So a designer is someone that makes decisions, very important. You have to be able to have an opinion and not be afraid to speak your opinion which is kind of scary sometimes because sometimes people don't agree, but the power of design is the more minds that are thinking on the same problem, the cooler of, of a result you're going to get. Um, okay, so why, who do they work with? Scenic designers work with 
the other designers that I mentioned earlier. So if we were going to do a play and I was the scenic designer, I would be working with the director whose vision the play is. So their job is to establish where we want to go. What is the play about and how we want to tell that story. So once we know where we're going to go, say if they want to go to um, the mall, if we want to tell our story in a shopping mall, that's important for the scenic designer to know. Um, if we want to go to the jungle, if it's a cool play like Jungle Book or like Beauty and the Beast, those are both done in jungles, but are they the same jungle? No. So as a designer, you get to decide, make decisions on what kind of spooky jungle, what kind of enchanted forest, what kind of jungle we're looking at and what that might look like to you and might look like to others that are watching the play. So that is what they do. That is who they work with. And why does scenic design matter? Well, I would say scenic design matters because it is important as a communication tool. So communication is all about letting others know the pieces to the puzzle. So our pieces to our puzzle will be our play. And your job to communicate is to let them know where they are, what kind of mood um, that they should be feeling or that the actors feel in that space and what it looks like and if it's really expensive and grand looking or if it's really dirty and grungy looking. So um, we are just communicators, but we communicate through visuals instead of through words or movements like the actors do. Very, very cool. And that's why it matters. Have you ever seen a show or a TV show or a musical or a music video where you really, really, really liked what the actors were like standing on? You were like, wow, this is a cool castle or wow, those rose bushes are really pretty or wow, that zombie apocalypse house looks really, really gross and dangerous. Um, those are all examples of designers working and communicating something to you and making you feel a certain way, which is pretty cool. So today we're going to talk about how to play around and create worlds and have fun as a designer. So we've established that a designer's job is to make an environment, but in this class, what environment do we want to make? So you can think about it and think about it, and we'll come back to that later. But as you're thinking about what environment you want to make, we got to come up with some rules. How are we going to make it? What are we going to make it out of? And how are we going to use that as a communication tool to the people that we're working with? So this is a unique situation to where we're in a class and we don't necessarily have to respond to all of those people and collaborate or work with all of those people that I named earlier. So you get even more freedom with your dreaming. Um, but as we are thinking about what kind of worlds we want to create, we got to think about, all right, there are some things, no matter what world you create, that will help make it look good. So some things that help make it look good is deciding on a color scheme. Color schemes are great because what colors you use can influence the mood, like we talked about earlier. If it's bright and rainbow, it'll be very exciting. And then if it's all kind of muted and dull, um, it'll be a little bit more mysterious. So we want to think about our color scheme. If we choose colors that go together really well, it will help our design or our environment be cohesive. And cohesive means that it all looks good together. So that's kind of up to the designer, right? That's up to you to choose, all right, is this cohesive? I think that this chair matches and looks really cool. But this, like, couch does not look good with it. I like this couch, but for this design, I'm probably not going to use it. Which is okay, because as a designer, you have the power to make that decision, which is pretty cool. Um, we have to think about, is it functional? So if I want to be, let's say, a princess in the movie Frozen, 
and have my own room in Elsa and Anna's castle in Arendelle, I want to make sure that, all right, if this is a bedroom, it has to be functional. If this is a play space, it has to be functional. So what kind of things belong in a bedroom? You could say a bed, a desk, a window, some cool walls, some cool art maybe, maybe a rug, you never know. So as the designer, you get to come up with what should be in this space. So as we're thinking about color scheme, as we're thinking about cohesiveness, thinking about is it functional, does it have what it needs to have in the space, I think is very important. All right, so then last things last is, is it cool? Do I think it's cool? Do I put a little bit of me in that personality? Um, of what I made. So sometimes when you design something, it's to fit a very strict purpose. Carly, I need a bedroom in Princess Anna's castle. Okay, cool, here's a bedroom. But since I'm the designer, I get to make it as cool as I want. And how do we make things cool? We put a little bit of ourselves into it. We put our opinions into it. We put what we like into it. We put things that not necessarily other people would pick out for us and we put a little bit of our own um, imagination into it and I think that's really important. So those are the things we want to focus on as we're thinking about what kind of environment do we want to create. We want to create an environment that has a fun color scheme, is cohesive, is functional, and is cool. And if you hit all of those tick marks then I think you're gonna like what you make. So next we'll talk about, well, Miss Carly, how do I use my imagination? I keep thinking and I don't know, I don't know necessarily what kind of environment I want to make. How do I inspire myself to dream? How do I inspire myself to think of all these things if I don't know what I'm trying to make? And that's a very good question. So how you're going to inspire yourself is Think about what you know and think about what you like. So I personally thought about my favorite Disney movie, which is Frozen, and I decided, you know what, Anna and Elsa are such cool sisters. I really like my sister, and if you don't know my sister, um, her name is Miss Miranda. She's pretty cool. Um, I really like my sister, so I would like to have my own room and be sisters with the Frozen Princesses, because I think that's really cool. And um, so, all right, that's how I picked what I wanted to make. You could pick your favorite TV show, which could be Phineas and Ferb. I don't know what kids like these days, but I'm sure you do. And it could be, all right, well, if I'm designing something for Phineas and Ferb, I could make a, I could make a backyard with a dungeon in it that makes a roller coaster out of it and that Doofenshmirtz has to take apart at the end of the day. I don't really, I don't really know. So it's all up to you. Um, pick your favorite thing, whether it be a TV show. I know I've been watching a lot of TV over quarantine. Um, it could be a movie. It could be a cartoon. It could be a book. You could create the environment for anything. So that is how you use your imagination, is you give yourself a purpose to start off from, to dream from, and then you move on from there. So then we get into the parts of the process, the how to take a dream and turn it into something tangible. Tangible means that you can touch it with your hands, that you can make it come to life almost. So we wanna take it from here and put it into a model. So a model is um, kind of a miniature version. It's a communication, not document, but 3D cool thing, like kind of like a diorama if you've ever made one for school, or like a gingerbread house that you don't eat, or like a dollhouse. Um, but making the model is an important part of the process. So. I will go over how to make the model together, but before we do our model, we need to do some research. And I have a fun way for you guys to do research, not only just thinking about the TV show or book or environment that you wanna make, but kind of putting yourself into it. So 
how I wanted to do that was with some magazines. So hopefully everyone has some magazines. If not, there is construction paper and you can draw these parts of your environments that you're dreaming up um, and start from there. So, 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 so. As we're doing our research before we make our model, we want to have fun ways to look at things. So using our imagination, having fun ways to look at things is maybe saying, okay, well, I want to be a princess in Arendelle. I want to be in that castle. What is something fun about that castle? Well, maybe there's ice everywhere. Maybe there's some cool ice sculptures. Well, I haven't really seen any ice sculptures in real life. So I go to my refrigerator, I take out an ice cube, and I really look at that ice cube and I'm like, wow, I never noticed that ice is sparkly before. I never noticed that sometimes ice is see-through and sometimes it's white and sometimes it looks blue. Or if it's snowing outside, I could say, hmm, well, sometimes ice is really flat and really pretty and really clean, and sometimes it's really crunchy looking and dangerous looking or is yellow because a dog peed in it. So um, when you are designing something, it's important to turn your little creative brain on and really think about things in a different way. Think about looking at things in a way that can serve your design. So, as we're finding out fun ways to look at things um, and details in our environments to think about differently, um, we should know how changing one thing changes everything. So if I were to design my room in a castle and I put a water slide in that, what do you think that would change about my character? What do you think that would change about the environment of Arendelle, what do you think that would be like? So know that your decisions are important, but you have complete control over them. So it is totally justifiable if I want to be the party princess that has the water slide in her room. Or if I want to be the princess that has the most books of all of everybody in Arendelle. It's really up to you. So as you're finding new fun ways to look at things, how changing one thing changes everything, it kind of teaches us about the power of design. So if you find yourself getting a little bit stumped saying, I don't know how to put myself into this design. I don't know what belongs in this environment. Really start with copying what you liked about the original. And once you have a starting place, you could kind of dream of things and put your own self into it. But that's a really good way to start. So if I was designing, um, a bedroom in the frozen castle. Something that would help me if I didn't know where to start is, well, I really like the shapes of the castle. I really like the royal colors of the dark greens and purples. I really like that it looks like a soft, cozy, homey place. So I'm going to start there and then as I decide what my character needs or what the environment needs to serve its purpose, um, that's when I can really start having fun and diving in. everyone's got a magazine. Um, but I want us to flip through those magazines and try to find cool things that we might want in our environment. So this page really sticks out to me because there are a bunch of pet portraits on it. So I'll show you. So this is pretty cool. I went ahead and already cut out my pet portrait that I wanted to keep. But if you feel comfortable, um, I like to start with my scissors, I hold them very carefully and I make sure not to cut anything besides what I want. So I'm gonna start with cutting it a little bit big and just putting it to the side. That way I don't have to wrestle with the paper while I'm trying to do all my precision cutting. So I'm just gonna put this to the side and save it for later. That way when I'm done using my magazine, I know what's scrap trash and what's something to save. Let's see what else. I really like um, 
I really like, I think this page is pretty cool. This page has some pillows and some lamps. So you're really gonna find what works best for your design. But something about this is it looks pretty modern, right? So this looks kind of like it belongs in my mom's house, but not necessarily in a castle in a place where they still wear really long dresses every day. So I'm gonna keep looking because that looks too retro. Um, these chairs are really cool. So look at these. Very neat. So they're pretty spunky and they're a little bit more flowery, which makes them look more royal. But I think the color scheme is a little bit off. So as a designer, you have all of the freedom to say, this works for this reason and this doesn't work at all. Um, and sometimes that can be frustrating, but sometimes it just makes the end product more worth it when you see your vision come to life. I'm gonna cut out a few more things. I hope that you're having fun cutting out your things. And then I'll show you what to do next. But feel free to take your time and do this as carefully as possible. I just found this really cool painting of mountains and I feel like in Arendelle, they might have some really cool mountains. And it looks like winter too, so that's a plus. So here you will see my magazine clippings all laid out and organized into what I like to call visual research. So this is something that will help us communicate to make sure that we're on the right page with anybody that we're having to work with. But right now, we're working alone, so it's awesome and you can kind of like narrow down what works and what you think doesn't work. So here is an up close look at all of my Arendelle bedroom furniture that I found. Next, we're gonna turn that visual research into a 3D model like how I was talking about earlier. I will attach some pictures of models that I've made in the past, but this model will be special because it is made out of a shoebox. Yes, hopefully you guys have a shoebox laying around. If not, just the lid of a shoebox will work or a piece of cardboard. You really just want something that you can make into your stage. You'll notice that a lot of these models that I'm showing you have a variety of different ways to get the message across. So some of them are drawings, some of them have painted walls and miniature furniture, and some of them have collaged furniture, just like how we're doing today. And don't worry if you can't find the perfect furniture in your magazines because you can always draw in what you're missing. I'm planning on doing that with a lot of my Arendelle magic. Today, we're going to talk about after our visual research. And after our visual research, we want to find what's missing. So finding what's missing means that, okay, looking at my visual research, I had a lot of chairs and a couch, but I was missing a bed, I was missing a floor, I was missing really the main parts of my walls. I had art to hang on my walls and stuff to put up against it, but right now we have an empty box or an empty stage. So just furniture isn't going to be a set or an environment. Um, we have to work to fill the whole thing. So we're going to start with finding out what's missing. And you can do that by making a list. You can make a list of the uh, Things that are missing, like for me, it's my walls and my floor and my bed. So I'm going to draw those things or um, color them on construction paper and then tape them or glue them into my box. I will show you an example when I'm done and then we'll move on. Okay guys, so you'll see now that I've added my walls, so my back wall and my floor, you can tell that it's starting to look a little bit more like a stage, which is really cool. But I want my stage to look like a bedroom. So what I'm going to do next is add my rugs, and those I can just tape right down onto the floor. Now a good trick to this is that you're probably, the more stuff you add, going to want to move things around. So I like to use tape in this special way where you take a little piece, just like this, and then you roll it up. And that way it's sticky on all sides. 
I can stick it on the back of my rug and I can lay my rug down but once I get more stuff down if I don't like where that is I can just pick it up boop, and move it around wherever I want so in my research I found these really cool doors and windows but you see next to my box they're a little bit too big compared to everything else and this is where we think about our word cohesive so does everything go together this would be an example of the scale not being cohesive and scale means the size of things compared to other things so if i have a giant snowflake mural on my wall and i have a rug that's this big and my door is this big that's a little bit too big so I'm gonna go ahead and trim the edges and cut it down just to make it the right scale it's okay that it ruins part of the door because it's only a communication document you can say well I really like this door but I want it to be this big and shrink it down same with the window so now that I've shrunk down my door and my window and I made part of my window into a light or another window above my door, which is pretty cool. And then I made my rugs flat and I kind of moved them around. Um, I'm going to continue to do so as my design continues to evolve. Um, and now I'm going to think about 3D things. So the things that are not flat against the floor or the wall. I have this awesome bookshelf. It's in my color scheme of my blues and my turquoise and my greens and my reds. And I think it would be cool if it popped out just a little bit. Something cool about stages is that it's important to think not only about what is closest to the audience, what's furthest away from the audience, but having a middle ground or somewhere in between that the actors can kind of weave in and out of and really integrate themselves in with the scenery. So I'm gonna put my bookshelf kind of sitting on the side here. I'm probably gonna cut the bottom of it so that it's not all wobbly. And then I'm gonna add a stiffener to the back. This stiffener is just my white construction paper. It can be any color, um, but I folded it to be a little bit thicker so that when I cut it, When I cut it, I can have something pop off, off of it and then glue this part to the floor and it'll stand up straight, kind of like a pop-up. So here is an up-close example on what that looks like. So I just taped on the paper folded up. That way it can stand once I tape it onto the floor. Here is an example of the stiffeners that I put on the back of my couch. Since it's a little bit wider, I put two of them. And um, it's kind of important to have the L shape meet the bottom of the um, piece of furniture or whatever you're trying to make stand up. Because if it's floating up here, your thing's gonna be a little bit tilted. So when I set it down, it stands right up. So here you can see I'm starting to add my finishing touches. I'm rearranging some things, putting things where I like, um, kind of rounding out my room, seeing what parts look a little bit empty and where I could add a few more of my things from my visual research. Everything that is standing up by itself and not against the wall has a stiffener on the back, that L-shaped piece of um, thicker paper that we talked about and all of my things were actually done with tape, so you can use glue if you want, but really, tape did quite a good job. And here is the finished product.
Well, that's all for today, guys. I really hope that you enjoyed learning about scenic design with me. I cannot wait for Miss Miranda or Mr. Nathan or Miss Lynn to show me all of your amazing scenic designs. I hope that you had fun and I hope that this inspires you to give yourself assignments to create and make things um, in the future. So thanks again. Bye from Miss Carly.